pain I hear our clients in is the pain I was in. And so people say, oh, dating, that's cute, that's fun. I'm like, no. And what happens is, especially the way we're experiencing it with like two-dimensional pictures, we're, set, we're starting to see people as products. It's being, people are being put up to us like they're products. So they're, the dating experience has become increasingly dehumanized because just as you're looking at your thing going, uh, no, no, maybe, no. Mia Lux Koning, she is the co-founder and CEO of Levette, a unique and exciting dating platform specifically designed for self-aware singles. With a colorful career history that includes comedy and experience design, Mia brings a unique perspective to the table when it comes to love and relationships. And anyone who says they don't want any kind of human relationship is usually just running away from wounding because love hurts. They had one quote unquote red flag. Back in the day it wouldn't be called a red flag, but on the female side it's, hey, this guy, I don't, it's any little flag, it becomes a critical red flag and they don't want to move forward. Women are like, I would literally rather be single than be in a bad relationship. Women are actually way more critical about men's looks and men are about women's looks. You think it was the other way around, but, but men tend to swipe a lot more generously than women do. Women tend to swipe on only quite good looking men. All of them. Human beings want to feel each other's energy. They want to, they, they want it to be magic for everyone trying to figure out like what is the new sexy? <laughs> what is the new sexy? The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Annette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Mia, thank you for being on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. No, thank you so much for having me on. Of course, this is pretty exciting because I don't think we've had a guest on here previously uh, talking about uh, love, dating yeah. and love and relationships. So that's it's uh, one that of the is, biggest parts of the human experience. You are missing out on, on a huge I totally part. agree. I totally agree. And this is why we're super excited. So first, I kind of want to talk about your journey over here first, because I know your journey is a little bit diverse here. From So you went from a comedian to co-founding a dating service. I'd love to learn a little bit more about you to kind of paint an overall picture uh, to see the, the, the Mia standing before me today. So I'd love to hear more about your background. Absolutely. And I think um, any entrepreneur, most people who end up starting their own businesses have unique arcs and my, my journey actually starts in law I was originally a litigator and so I came from a very wow. kind of traditional professional background and you know I'm not sure which kind of uh, what kind of worldview you grew up in but I grew up in New Zealand which was very linear it was like you sell your hours for money that's it that's the business mm. model and you know growing up like that and being a lawyer where you have to every six minutes you have to record what you're doing for billing it oh. turned my life into this like unbelievable, like feeling like I'm just a cog in a machine kind of experience. And it, it made me really in my heart ask, like, is this what human existence is? And so I broke out of law with the complete other direction and decided I wanted to teach. And so I actually retrained and became a high school teacher, which is where my love for education, for pedagogy, for the human mind, for psychology started. And I used to teach uh, kids with learning and behavioral difficulties. So it was a very, very, very challenging situation. And, you know, but being in front of those kids in those classrooms uh, taught me about what does it take to teach the human mind, to keep human attention. And if you can teach high school students, you can teach anybody, right? And so I think for me, yeah, like, like most entrepreneurs, it's been a journey of learning skills and then ultimately coming to the question of how does a person, whoever you are, how do you take what you have, your unique combination of passions and skills and talents, and how do you apply that into a creative and impactful direction? And so like the TLDR mm. is ultimately um, having, I worked for a company called Mind Valley doing personal growth education products, running their film studios, uh, doing comedy and hosting events all around the world at the same time. 
And, and then ultimately my come to Jesus moment was getting divorced during the pandemic. And I would say like the pandemic was like relationship survivor. You know, some people got stronger people. Some people like me yeah. got thrown off the Island and I found myself <laughs> single, moved back to New York in winter in the pandemic. And of course, jumping on the dating apps and, you know, having gone through this experience of done so much personal growth and seen what was possible in terms of human connection and relationships, jumping onto the dating apps, I saw essentially the dystopian nightmare of where technology is pushing love. And my co-founder, she's an incredible coach who's built a big coaching company with tens of thousands of people. We sort of were sitting together and going, this can't be what people are forced to use. If everyone is being forced to use these systems, the quality of love and the quality of relationship that's going to get produced is going to be lower. The happiness is going to be lower. They're going to get together, have kids. They're going to divorce. Like the impact of bad love on society in terms of the, the intergenerational effects is actually pretty profound. And so people say, oh, dating, that's cute. That's fun. I'm like, no, like dating has the capacity to really create a healthy or unhealthy society, depending how we date, yeah. depending how we choose our mates and depending how we have those relationships. So that's, that's kind of how I got onto to this soapbox in this moment. I mean, th this story is kind of crazy, wow. not being a lawyer. I mean, it's not just you, you're just b born and you are a lawyer. You have to study like crazy work. Yes. It's, it's a lot of, yes. and then you just it's give up this for, for, for giving a try for the dating app. Was it the easiest well, solution? Well, Vlad, think about well, this. Well, I didn't even, like, it's even crazier than that. Think, and I'm not sure, but Vlad, did you, have you, you studied? Have you, did you do a degree in something? Yeah, I did a business degree. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you, but you're actually using your degree. Well done. You're one of the few people who's actually <laughs> using the degree right. they studied in. <laughs> I'm in the latter. My, my background's in molecular biology. So. <laughs> okay. So you and I are more on the same page, but I think, I think yes. the point is like, you're right. It was six years of study plus then sitting the bar like, and then working in it. Like this was an enormous amount of investment of energy, but I found myself in my early twenties faced with either sticking with it for the rest of my life and being miserable or making a hard decision and taking the cut then. I didn't even have love at then. There was no, I had nothing else on the table when I left being a lawyer. But I think people are asked to make these decisions, whether it's in a job or a relationship, even if you don't know yet what's right for you, if you know what isn't working, having the courage to say no to that and walk away is the first right. step, right? So it's not easy, but yeah. like I, I've seen that play out over time where people stay with things they shouldn't stay with, like I said, whether a relationship or work. And there's just like an increasing misery index over time. No, I, um, I, I want to go ahead and briefly talk about, I know you mentioned about the other dating apps that you were currently using. And so what are the negative aspects? Is it the algorithms? Is it, the, is it a specific part of the technology? I mean, what's, what, what exactly is the issue with a lot of the current uh, mm -hmm. dating apps out there that is causing let's say, a, a, a horrible experience or a bad experience? Well, I first just want to couch this with like, like every piece of technology, like every design, it's never just bad. It's never just good. Um, I acknowledge mm -hmm. like for me, the shift into using technology for dating was an inevitable and important one. And one thing it did give us is access, right? So the beautiful thing about online dating is we, we have had the ability to access and interact with people we would never normally be able to. And I think that's beautiful. So the abundance and access that it created, I think I, I want to acknowledge straight up. But what happened is like with every single type of company or technology, you have to ask yourself, where does the money go? How does the money work? How the money works tells you mm. what that system is built for. And Unfortunately, just the way that things are, and this is something we definitely have tried to differentiate, differentiate with Levet, it's definitely a struggle, is that most of these systems work very much in a kind of social media way, right? So they're, they make their profit by keeping you on the platform. They make the profit by not right. making it work enough, so you have to pay to make it sort of work. So the way that they make their money has nothing to do with you succeeding and everything to do with you being addicted and staying. And so when you track that, 100%. you have to ask yourself, like, well, you're using these systems, but you're succeeding despite the system, not with the support of the system. So you, you kind of have wow. that kind of dystopian element, which again, like I don't think people are bad. I think this is like you have an economy and you have a system which works a certain way. These companies have to make sense economically. This is how they do it. Right. But then you have the human psychology element too, right? Which I get into, which is that abundance is great, but have you ever heard of um, the paradox of choice? It's like they're like kind of exploring 
how much choice do people really want? And what they found is like, mm. like people like about <laughs> eight choices, eight to 13 choices, mm. eight to 13 choices on anything. They're like, mm. they feel like they had a lot to choose from and they're really sure about the decision they made. Once you have over 13 choices, your brain starts to experience stress because trying to make a decision mm. out of many, many, many choices, imagine looking at 50 different toothpaste brands. Like we do, we go to yep. CVS for like 50 toothpaste brands. I'm like, how, the, how do I choose out of 50 toothpaste brands, right? Now imagine that 300,000 people on a dating app, right? So we have this yeah. overwhelming experience now where in some ways the abundance is amazing, but in other ways it's, it's kind of desensitized us and overwhelmed us. And what happens is especially the way we're experiencing mm. it with like two-dimensional pictures, we're, set, we're starting to see people as products. It's being, people are being put up to us like they're products. So the, the dating experience has become increasingly dehumanized because just as you're looking at your thing going, uh, no, no, maybe, no, you know yeah. that other people are looking at you with your beautiful heart bared to the world going, eh, no, maybe, yes. And so the, there's a kind of a cruelty in the system. It's kind of like a love survivor or love hunger games feeling to it. Um, <laughs> Uh, which has made people feel dehumanized, disposable, replaceable. And so I think the systems are ultimately, I don't think they're meant to, but I feel like they're setting people up for poor behaviors and to fail, essentially. If you're looking for like a healthy, thriving relationship, anyway. Hey there, before we dive back into the episode, I wanted to stop for just a brief moment and express our heartfelt gratitude. Knowing that you've chosen to spend your time with us to listen and engage with our content truly warms our hearts. Every story we share, every topic we discuss is made much more meaningful if you are here with us on this journey. If you found value in what you've heard so far and you're excited as we are about the episodes to come, we'd be so honored if you'd hit that subscribe button. It not only ensures you stay informed of all of our new content, but it also supports us in continuing to create and share. From all of us here, a sincere thank you. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the episode. A lot of interesting points that are said right there. It's funny because when I think about it, it, the, it seems so obvious uh, that this, the, the traditional um, dating apps make money based off of your failure, based off of you not getting enough matches. So you go on their premium. It seems pretty obvious, but I actually never thought about that. There is sort of a, I don't know, now that I'm thinking about it, it is sort of a, it makes me feel a little weird. I, I don't know, I, Vlad. <laughs> I, I, I even don't know how do they make money because... I, I, I even don't know if I was using a dating well, app ever. Never, it, yeah. It's paid? You have to pay for well, these apps? Most of them are free, but then what they do, especially for men, and this, and this is like we can talk about the men and women face different challenges on the apps. Like women face a lot of like unwanted sexual messaging, um, abusive mm. messages, like lie. Like women face a certain set of issues. Men face fake profiles, women driving to porn sites, the algorithms punishing them. And, the, and largely they make their money off men. And so what they do is they're limiting the, the success men have on their systems and making men pay to unlock it. So you can sign up for free, but then you're noticing oh, I'm only getting two matches a week. And so then you pay to be boosted to have more accessibility, right? And, you know, cool. I think one of the things we, for me especially on the vet, I wanted to change was that what I noticed, this is kind of very funny phenomenon, but if you ask someone like in a survey, you ask them like, what are you looking for? people will often describe their partner by superficial characteristics. And women have a tendency to go, I want someone six foot or over. They have the story about mm -hmm. like what they want. I want someone like this. And so when they go into dating apps, they set their parameters a very specific way that filters out 88% mm -hmm. of men. There's only 12% of men are <laughs> six foot and over. But when I yeah. ask women, why do you want a man who's six foot? They go, well, I want to feel feminine. I want to feel safe. And I say, well, could you mm. imagine meeting someone who's like 5'9", five, 5'10", five, who's integrated in his masculine energy, who's an incredible lover, who adores you, who makes you feel safe, who puts his arms around you. And she's like, oh, yeah. So I'm like mm. people don't even know what they want. And so what happens with these apps is that like there's a massive skewing because you're asking people to make judgments on pictures and statistics that don't take into account how somebody feels what they, how they talk. Like there's a kind of an interpersonal chemistry you can't capture in that superficial map. There's no, you know, they're, they're trying to put video in, but it's very hard to retrospectively make people use video. But like even right here, like I can, you know, we've never met in person, 
But already for both of you, I can get a sense of you. You can get a sense of me, right. how I'm talking, how I'm moving. These are the things that people are missing out on. And they're making some of the most important mm. decisions of their life with no correct data. And it's another one of those mm -hmm. kind of like set people up to fail things. Hmm. So this is, this is what differentiates Lovet from the different apps, right? So um, my next question would be about the vetting process. Could you please delve more a little bit into this topic? Because I know I've heard you describe the traditional dating apps as a fast food, <laughs> quick, easy, but always satisfying in the long run. And on the other hand, Lovet seems to be the gourmet experience in the dating world. So what's the vetting process you have in your app? Yeah, so one of the ways I like to explain this to people before I go into like the technicalities is I want you to think about like before you use the dating apps, how did you use to meet people? Like where would you meet, where did you partner up with people? It's like friends of friends. Online, friends of friends. You know, college or like if you're at school together, yep. um, maybe a hobby group. <laughs> yeah, like it was, it was largely in these kinds of um, vetted social contexts, you had these experiences where like mm, you'd meet yeah. someone and when you met somebody, someone that you knew kind of knew them. So there was this kind of like social and sort of like safer feeling to it and more accountable because everyone was connected in some way. And so this is how we, and think about it way, way back. You were really, you know, marrying, marrying within family structures, families to families. Like, right. It's only very recently that we start dating strangers from the internet, like literally going on the internet yeah. and being like, hey, and then meeting up with strangers. And, and like, it's a pretty radical, pretty radical thing. Yeah, and is. again, fun because of the abundance. But then look at this, the ghosting. Look at like a billion dollars last year lost in scams online, romance scams, right, in, in America. Mm. Um, the violence. And Australia's federal government just ran a review into online dating because there were a string of murders. People were using these apps to find their victims, right? So you, you're, you're managing, in some ways, the most intimate part of human relationships, dating, getting to know each other, wanting to open your heart, with also some of the most dangerous behavior you have to... Um, uh, encounter and disappointing behavior like you know like the catfishing and the ghosting and the lying right yeah so i, I always try to explain to people like the, there's a reason why we're doing the vetting which is that we want to use the best of the abundance of online dating access to new people finding people who are values fit but we want that to feel like it's safe and within a vetted container of people you can trust and so the way that we do this is that we're not vetting like most of the exclusive apps vet for fame. Like, are you famous enough to be on our app? Mm -hmm. Or they vet mm -hmm. for, you know, did you go to Ivy League University? Are you, are you rich enough? Are you a financial guy? Um, we don't vet for status. We're vetting for safety. So we're like, are you a awesome, coherent person? <laughs> you know, like, are you a real person who wants to build real human connections? You, and, and like, will you do that? So we have two ways we vet, a hard vetting and a soft vetting. The hard vetting is a background check. We're the only system that uses mm. actual certified third-party background checks. Everyone else's background checks are like social. They're like, you put in the email address and the number. Mm. And in America, that means nothing. So we, we do a third-party background check. And the soft vetting is everything in our platform is video. So when you apply, you submit a couple videos. And our team hand vets everybody. So if there's anything that ever kind of raises a flag in their submission, you know, either that's a no or we jump on a call with them to get clarification to make sure that this person feels like a good fit. And what that does is that by going through the process of having, you know, A, care enough to show up, be on video and make it make like actually be a real applicant, go through mm -hmm. a background check. The people who are inside the club are awesome. And we've been able, we've had like 130 plus live virtual experiences in that club, talking from anything from health and nutrition to like sexual intimacy, like a broad range of topics with like live teachers and never have we had an incident. Like our, our members are so mm. attuned and coherent that suddenly the quality of how you can interact, the quality of how you're able to be together shifts dramatically. And that's why I say like the fast food out there where you're dealing with like literally the nonsense of dealing with people who like say one thing, disappear, are not even real, they're a bot, they're this to actually trusting that every person you meet when you're getting out there and trying to date is a real person and is in an accountable vetted community. So I think establishing that basic sense of safety 
even though it seems so rudimentary, is one of the most important things, whether it's Levet or any other dating system, is going to have to do moving forward. You can see Bumble, Tinder, they're all trying to build in like a premium vetted version um, because they see right. this is such a big problem now. Do, do, you have, do you have to be? Do you have to pay to register in in your app or not? So for us right now, because we are in what we call like membership mode, so we're building our foundational founding members. It's free now, but only for like a few more months. We've been running free for about six to seven months, building our kind of core first group of people. But we will be a membership platform. So our monetization. So again, talk about where does the money go? How does the money work? How do you know if you can trust a company? We we are a membership club. We our money model will be like everybody pays the door. It's like belonging to a learning、mm-hmm. community, and because we have like we have dating coaches, doctors, we have, we have all kinds of interesting people that come in and teach in our world. It's like being part、mm-hmm. of a social experience. So while、yeah. you're dating, you're also getting to have experiences and learn and grow. And the way that we make it safe for everybody is that people pay at the door, which means that they're serious and they know that they're not. We're not sneaking them in and then making money off、right. them on the back end. Like we're very clear. Like we pay up front and we give you a great experience. I mean,、so、we, the main reason why I ask because. Because you you mentioned that you're doing a background check, and if somebody is registering for、mm-hmm. free, I mean it's not free to make to do a background、that's、check. It's not free. You have for to us, spend、no. money. But it's worked. But we've、Thanks. made that decision. That's one of the great things about being in a position where, as a startup, having raised money, we can make the investment. Say、right. yes, it does. It costs us X amount per person to background check, but to build a awesome user base of vetted members, that's important and it's worth it. I love that. Honestly, do you, do, do you,、uh, I know you're still in that. You may not have a pricing structure yet, but do you do you have any idea yet what the pricing yeah, will be?、Absolutely. What it looks no, like on a month to month basis? Yeah, yeah, yeah.、Oh, and is, to, and to you, give is, context for people, because we're going to move to that model in probably in about three months' time. So we're moving towards the paid membership wall.、Um, and just to give context, like one of the things when I was single, I was like, "Huh, you can go onto systems like Bumble or whatever and pay thirty bucks a month." To kind of upgrade, which just means more visibility, or you can go to an app、right. like the League and pay between a hundred to a thousand dollars a month, again just for more vis- more visibility. You can go to a private matchmaker and spend sixty to a hundred k, get a few matches、right. and maybe it works. But there's just like there wasn't like I was like where's the where's the in between one like where's where's like、right. high quality but doesn't going to cost me six thousand dollars a month.、Um, Where's that? Like、so、the people we go for are professionals. They're largely people who, you know, they're they have great jobs, they have a great life. They're not maybe famous, and they're not like necessarily a financial person. So like, so for us, we're pitching it at it's a three month subscription of five hundred and fifty five dollars. It's like one hundred and eighty five bucks、mm. a month. And the way we put it is like it's less, it's less than taking one Uber ride a week to a bad date. <laughs> and you know, this is and this is what we have like. It's just、that's, you know. I listen、yeah. in New York. That's a good now, sentence. Yeah. When I was dating in New York, how much money I spent on dating and time and, pu-、wow. and like we said, like putting on pants to go meet someone, only to know within three minutes, oh shit, like this is never going to work, right? And I think we've all、wow. had that, especially for men. The expenditure for men taking women、yeah. out on dates and the money you can easily blow like a couple hundred bucks on dating a week if you're dating. And so like instead, like the way that we build our model, it's like a retraining and a teaching model. We teach people. When you meet someone on the platform and you're getting a vibe, we have something called the the virtual vibe check, which is a beautiful designed one to one video space where you jump in, and it has like a whole bunch of cool automatically facilitated questions, like those kind of questions, like the、mm. I, are we really strangers deck or whatever. And so we say to people, jump into a ten or fifteen minute video call. It's a quick vibe check, and get to know each other. And then based on that video call, you will know if you actually want to go on a date with them or not. It's such a, a time saver. And so teaching people these ways to like date intelligently, that way they actually they connect with people who are a good use, like and a good match for them,、um, and don't end up going on really just crappy repetitive first dates. So I, I I suppose I should be very grateful that I mean I met my now wife and we started dating when I was like I think like nineteen years old. So, so I like did, I skipped you, that entire experience. You, you saved a lot of money, and, and 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 that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't exactly. Ah,、uh, but I think same thing with you, Vlad. I mean, you've been in, like long term relationships. And where did you I, meet all my friends? Where did Vlad? I met. She 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 started、time? to work for me as a yoga teacher. <laughs> I hired her. Let's, I, let's, we were training to her. We'll, we'll we'll bleep that out. I don't、yeah. know if that's a. I don't know if that's a. <laughs> that's a great statement to make on camera、uh, or video, but I guess it is the truth. <laughs> it is. But thing, like, uh, we, you know, you now have of, like、yeah. how did we meet, right? Like, and so for, yes, you guys are both very lucky because trust me, what happens is 
I, in my experience with women, what makes, especially women to men, it's not always true. I think it's it's both ways, but I've noticed this, especially with women, where women are being asked to judge men just on their looks. And mm. women are actually way more critical about men's looks than men are about women's looks. You think it was the other way around, but, but mm. men tend to swipe a lot more generously than women do. Women tend to swipe on only yeah. quite good looking men, all of them, right? Mm, so right. this is, whereas actually when you meet men in person, women, the kinds of men that women find attractive when they meet men in person changes very much. It doesn't skew towards just good looking men. It skews towards men who are right. warm, personable, and integrity, have an energy to them. Like so much of what is missing, like, and so that's the skewing there. And so you're lucky because like if you were dating now, you would essentially have to take a bunch of photos of yourself, reduce yourself to a two-dimensional selfie, write some stupid caption that no one's even going to read, and then like right. put yourself out there and hope – just hope that someone swipes and makes it make sense. You yeah. know? And that is a devastating place for most people to be in. No, that sounds horrible. And yeah, no, I have quite a few friends that are in this dilemma right now. And they've, they're, they're, they're the problem areas that you've just hit on is exactly their pain points. And uh, yeah, I'm very fortunate because I am not six feet. So <laughs> <laughs> I would certainly have a, a, a lot of issues perhaps uh, on the, on, on the apps. I'd love to talk just a, a briefly about, I, I know you've, of course, um, raised uh, pre-seed funding of around 2 or $2.2 $2 million at the moment. Uh, for for uh, we, for some of our listeners, uh, we'll, we'll take it up very quickly to the entrepreneurship route. Uh, any insights into uh, or any tips for other founders out there that have this idea uh, for a startup? Any advice in terms of uh, raising a, a seed round or a pre-seed round even? Yeah, I mean, listen. We, Especially I, in this current climate. I was just going to say, like, I've say. learned, I've learned a lot of things the hard way, and I'd say, I'd also just say, like, I, I'll couch this with that we were very fortunate that when we raised, it was definitely a good time to raise. Twenty twenty one was a great mm. year to raise. Um, you know, we've been looking at raising another round now. It's a very different environment, so I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, yeah. just do these things because I, I also think the times change, times adapt. I yep. did get really excellent advice recently from someone who's uh, Naveen Jain, who's a, he's an incredible oh, yeah. billionaire who has built some of the most epic things. He's a wonderful human. And he it's was amazing. sharing about like his formula, if you want to like raise for a big company is to really focus on like, like a vision that really inspires. Like you have to be so clear that like what you're building is has a vision, even if it's like back end software for something that ties into something important, mm. right? If you're like um, a checkout software for things, you're like, well, I want, I want great products to be available easily and quickly to people. Like there's something in the heart of solving something for humanity. And then you see like really get a great team, like go use that vision to excite the people who can help, like go build and get a, some great people on your team who would be in for it and then go raise money. It's like that's those two things together, an amazing vision that sells people who are already in that space. Like you go to them and be like, I know you're passionate about this. I know you work on this. If I can raise some money, would you be part of this? Um, he's like, that's the way to raise in this, especially in this environment. So I think often we get stuck on like business plans and this and practical stuff and that will all come. But I think if you're, if yeah. you're very much at the beginning, your vision and your people are key. Um, then in terms of other practical things, like I can only speak to the way we did it. Um, we, we raised through private angels. So we raised through, you know, people who were interested in and found the space relevant. Um, and again, mm -hmm. mission oriented. So it kind of, it can be, and in that way it can be, we were very lucky in the sense that both my co-founder and I are very connected in that space. So I would also acknowledge mm -hmm. that there is a degree of relationship building that, you know, if we want to raise right. that way works. Um, but you know, there are so many incredible, like, pre-seed and seed funds now like hundreds of them who are all yeah. have their own different focuses so it's kind of like if you're submitting for a book contract like submit to 200 right. and get the three phone calls and see if one sticks like there's a degree of yeah. persistent optimistic tenacity that you have to hold you know and i think that's that's <laughs> to test you have to really drink your own kool-aid and believe in it um and really be willing to sell it as the visionary opportunity it is and believe in that. Right. I, 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 since we're talking about, and, you know, we've, we've spent, we spent now 20, almost 30 minutes talking about 
Lafette, I I love I love your app. I love the idea behind it. You want to jump on? <laughs> I, I think you're solving a very important problem, a problem that I hear often. Uh, no, and I think the price point, pricing is perfect because if that specific, you're you know, you're going after a, a specific uh, customer segment, which the pricing isn't an issue as well. I'm very excited to see, like moving forward, what amazing things you do and and, and growing it. I mean, I mean, starting and, a company and, and plus actually this this vicious, this, it's... this kind of pricing is also is another process of vetting the people because somebody who is willing to pay this amount of money already means. Right. That they are, they you know, not, right. And they care. And I think, right. and I think it's, Blair, that's a really great point. I think part of what, you know, the, the pain I hear our clients in is the pain I was in. But when I rewind three years ago to being single in New York and dating and, and being in my thirties and really being ready for a relationship, really being like, I value partnership. I want to create great love. I want to have a life filled with love that pain point is very high. And I think people who are like, you guys are partnered, so it's easy to forget. But when you're single and you don't want to be single, you want to be in a relationship, especially if you're young, you want to start a family, these kinds of things. Like people are extremely motivated, yeah. extremely motivated. Mm. And, and it's one of the yeah. highest, it's one of the highest things on their list. And, hmm. you know, again, to the point of like dating can seem trivial, but I really, if you look at, the fact that human relationships, specifically love relationships, are the number one factor in, in, in like impacting a person's happiness, you realize that mm -hmm. this is really important. And we, we live in a world now where like people are increasingly single because women can provide for themselves. And women are now right. very much not willing to settle for relationships that are suboptimal. Women are like, I would literally rather be single than be in a bad relationship. And so now they're Let's, gatekeeping we talk at a new level. Can we talk more about that, actually? Because yeah. this is another problem that I hear from both sides. And in fact, I do see, and I'm not an expert by any means. I d have done no research or have no empirical data that I've reviewed. This is strictly from my conversations with male friends and female friends. Uh, on the male side of things over here, what I hear is, oh my God, you know, it's... Uh, they'll they'll go into you know dating a couple of dates and their experiences they had one quote unquote red flag I mean, back in the day it wouldn't be called a red flag but on the female side it's hey this guy I don't, it's any little flag it becomes a critical red flag and they don't want to move forward and as you just said it's like hey i'd rather be single than deal with this this crap because and it seems afraid. like to me there's no longer compromise yeah. or no longer negotiations or like hey this i don't want to call it even a red flag whatever it's i don't know can we call it a purple flag this purple flag can be fixed and maybe it can be a orange or a green flag instead of a red flag i mean i think now it's a lot of red flags are not really it shouldn't be classified as a red flag uh like what what's it yeah is that is, is that well, what's I, going on in this space few, right there's now there's a few things going on right which is that on one hand we have the dating culture where everyone is replaceable because you can hmm. just jump on the apps and find someone else in five minutes and so our willingness to persist and be curious and and figure things out is very low. So now, yeah, like, I don't like the way he uses his cutlery, but I'm dating four other guys, so I'll just ditch him. Or vice versa, mm. right? So, like, I do think you're right. There's a degree of, like, disposability, which, if, which men and women talk about, that feeling that, like, if you make one small mistake, you'll just get replaced or they'll move on. Right. And that's a terrible feeling. So we, we've, we've really devalued what it means to connect with someone we have so many connections most of them not the right ones but we perceive it as so many connections that we don't value each one so that's one part of it mm. but the other part is i think i think there is like a degree of kind of awakening around the fact that most people have had bad experiences they've been in toxic relationships or unconscious mm. relationships yeah and they don't want to repeat it now, do they have the skills yet to learn how to do it right? That's the problem. So in Levet, like a bigger part of our focus is teaching people the skills. The red flags that people see is one thing, but most people end up dating people that have a thousand red flags that they shouldn't have dated because they're unconsciously replicating the attachment bonds of their childhood. And they have no idea. They don't know what they're looking for. They have a list of things that is just nonsense. Like there's no intentionality. So part of what we're doing with Levet is like, 
teaching people how to date as they go, teaching them how to ask questions, how to resolve conflict. Like we've lost so much of our basic related, but like relational skills. Maybe we just never had them. I'm not sure. But, but I think there's an emphasis, emphasis on wanting that. So what I do think is happening though, is I do think women are balancing, like there's a lot of, especially in New York, there's a lot of like, well, I don't need a man. What does a man bring me? Right, right. right. But, but we, the, the <laughs> right. truth is like, yeah, we don't need people, but like what a blessing to be in relationship with a man. Like what a blessing or woman or whoever you're interested. Like right. having deep, loving human relationships is an incredible privilege, adds so much texture to life. And anyone who says they don't want any kind of human relationship is usually just running away from wounding because love hurts to them, mm. right? So we have yeah. that. But then we also have the fact that like both men and women are also like, like I said, they don't want to go down a road of a bad relationship again. And so I think there is this, this push where you can see it. And this is why we, we say we're for self-aware singles. All the women I speak to are like, I want a man who is really willing to communicate about his feelings. I want a man who mm. is really intentional about approaching a relationship. More than I want a guy who's rich, I want a guy who's handsome. Like women are now pivoting to much more of an emotional focus and wanting a man who can emotionally mm. provide necessarily more than financially provide right so this is a big shift over the last 50 years and right. like there is a there is kind of like a recalibration catch-up um for everyone trying to figure out like what is the new sexy <laughs> what is the new sexy i would say self-awareness right. is the new sexy i really really think that um but we can see it and it's cool. I mean, you, I, whenever you dare to go on the internet, you just see like men and women are kind of at each other's throats right now. It feels like there's a lot of divisiveness, mm. people blaming each other. Whereas I really think it, this is a collective issue on both sides. And if we're given the right tools, there are so many amazing teachers out there, coaches, therapists who have the tools. We give people the tools. They'll be able to date better, select healthier and right. build healthier relationships, which leads to healthier long-term relationships. If they choose to have children, it means better, healthier, you know, family units and kids ra get raised happily. Like we're in a very broken relational society right now. And I think we underestimate how much of that trauma is impacting every other as aspect of our society. No, I love the fact that you, it's, you also, you, you do it, you have videos on this, on your app, on and 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 live as well right those is it is it is it both so it's like pre-recorded videos a bunch of yeah. videos like a course we that have they can what we run call community Plus... leaders yeah so we have like community leaders okay. who are experts in the wellness health personal development dating space they make um content for us and then we do like live video experiences and our spaces are so beautiful like you know you go into like google meets or zoom it's like a black thing we have like a beautiful right. background like and you bump in a little bubble so it's like a social space we have a speakeasy we have okay. a pantheon we have a, and so we do live video experiences where members can jump in on camera and we have a teacher right. and so it becomes like a social experience where like you met someone in college when you were learning maybe you meet someone when you go to like you know an intimacy class or you know a health a health class right. whatever it is so um or like a, a dating trivia night whatever so again trying mm. to mimic and recreate uh, a virtual version of that experience. No, I love the fact that you said that you are educating people on how to be a better at dating, to be a better at relationships. So how, how do you do that? You have, as you said, you have social clubs. So there is some kind of uh, like a coach coming and giving in yeah. lecture yeah. or, so or how, how does it happen? Amazing. Amazing dating coaches, experts, like we'll bring them in. I'll do, we could do sometimes like an interview. Sometimes we'll do like a inter interactive workshops with people. And just for context, like my co-founder, Lauren Zander, she, she's an extraordinary coach. Like she's, um, she was a huge part of who helped me clean up my life and get my dating life in order. And she's built out a whole model. And like one of the models she uses is called head, heart, and hoo-ha, the three H's, which is like an intentional dating model. So all of that's built into the platform too. So people are able to use these tools that are like built in to help them like reflect on what they're looking for. And so it's, it's, a, we, it's really like we say, like we're using technology and psychology. Like we're really trying to integrate mm. good dating coaching into the system so that as people are looking for their partner, they're also learning by osmosis. You know, they're, they're in a, a, in a community that has a shared language and has shared expectations around how you treat each other just come bringing people back to like basic civilized interaction <laughs> and and all yeah, the I, sessions sorry Annette, and all the sessions going to be included into the pricing 
Yeah, absolutely. Or they are like, so that's, and, and no, how no, many no. sessions, let, let, let's say a week or something. Mm -hmm. Sorry about asking the business questions only and not about no, no, love. No, of course. No, of course. <laughs> so the way during our learn mode, we were running about like one, one live experience a week. Our goal is mm. with paid as we build, because as, as the membership builds, we'll do essentially one teaching experience a week and one dating experience. So the dating experience really being geared around giving people a chance to really meet each other. So we'll have a, um, a chance for people to be able to jump into a room with people from New York or Chicago or LA, wherever they're from, and be able to connect that way. And then like bringing in an expert. So that's kind of the plan for as we move into our paid membership model. Hmm. Yeah, I want to ask you an interesting, but also very annoying question uh, in this space, because I certainly would be annoyed if somebody asked me this right now, which is the big hype right now, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about it. Investors are talking yeah. about it. And people who are not investors are talking about it. So let's talk about a little bit about it. Uh, I just wanted to see your thoughts in general. Uh, do you have any thoughts around AI, on how you see AI, I mean, currently specifically with these large language models uh, models out right now, Does that is that going to shape the future of the dating industry? Or is, yeah, what, what are your thoughts in general about it? It's such a great question. My team and I just did like a, we did like a big workshop on this the other day. Um, I everything is going to get, be impacted by AI, including dating. And you can already see it. There's already mm. an app out there, I can't remember what its name is, that's built around the idea of like an AI matchmaker. So I think, I think mm -hmm. there's going to be two schools of thought. There's going to be the people who take AI and be like, ah, this is the new matching algorithm. This is finally right. what <laughs> OkCupid and eHarmony promised they would do, which is we'll be able to find, we'll be able to make perfect matches between people because now we have the data. So I think there will be that approach I personally don't think that's going to work because I, seeing and knowing how people behave, there's something strange in us that resists being told who we think we should be with. We like to discover it for 100%. ourselves. We like to think we made the choice. And so while I think AI might be supportive and maybe, um, but you, I just don't think it will be. And, and the reason why is like the, the way the AI is going to get information is from people and people just don't know what they want. People say they know what they want. So the AI will go off what it's given bring the best results based on that. And the person's going to be like, ew, no, I don't want to be with that person. <laughs> right. No, I, I actually agree you know, with you. I agree with but you. They, they, but it'll learn. So like, I, I, do, I do see potential. Where I, where I think is actually more interesting is that I do like the idea, like we, we were talking about like, could we bring in essentially like really good AI support in terms of helping people with their human interactions, right? So having like mm. we have a like having like an ai love bot or love coach who is like supporting you with your experience so if they see that a date didn't mm. go well like they have a basic database of coaching information that they could go to or or just having like the ability um to yeah i guess i guess just to have touch points the challenge with dating with ai i think is that human beings this is a relational element same with the metaverse people are like oh metaverse dating I'm like mm. Human beings want to feel each other's energy. They want to, if they want it to be magic, we still have like Disney love in us. And so anything that feels too automated and too systematized is what right. makes us feel disillusioned and drained. And so I'm curious how it all goes, but it's definitely going to be a, it's definitely going to have to be some kind of balance of using that information to support people to make good choices or to write good messages and to support them without it being like, here's your dystopian future, here's your future wife, now get married, right? So. Right. <laughs> well, actually, I, I, let's, I don't know how I feel about that, but it's, it's definitely going to happen where uh, the, the apps will come out where they will help you craft responses. In fact, it's probably yep. out already. Yes. It uh, already uh, it's to, already out there. For, yeah. Yeah, which is crazy. I, 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 I mean, can dating coach. So, it literally, yeah. I don't, I don't I mean, yeah. well, actually, that I'm not an expert. But what, but what about if, if it's gonna so I, if I it's no gonna help you craft the answers and when you're really gonna come out and, and meet the person and you're gonna be ah, ooh, uh, well, and you will not be able to just, even this, speak, you know? This, that's exactly it. And like what I keep what that's my experience has been is that like anything that like the stuff that really works is working with someone actually on themselves. So like the biggest misconception about dating is that like yes, you can get better at dating in terms of like there are very practical things you can do to make your dating life 
make a lot more sense, be more enjoyable, be practically mm-hmm. better. Like, but you can learn those in like a day. The rest of it right. is like, if you really want to improve your dating life and find your person, you have to do the work on yourself. You have to go back and figure mm. out why have I made these series of choices or mistakes? Why did my relationships not work out? Where am I emotionally stuck? Like there, the best way to fix your dating life is to heal whatever is not fixed inside of yourself. Like that's just part of it. And so if we have AI systems that can support people in that process, then Vlad, to your point, rather than just like essentially having like an AI wingman that writes all your messages and then you go on the date and it's so awkward. <laughs> right. Yeah. Instead, right. you have an AI support, which is teaching you how to emotionally mm-hmm. regulate, figure out what you want. And then from that place, understanding yourself better, you're then engaging and interacting with people more effectively. That would be my prayer for how it gets used rather than like taking the responsibility of empathic development and self-awareness off somebody it's used as a way to cultivate that in people Hmm. yeah Yeah, this is certainly a very interesting time uh we'll see all the interesting new technology tools that come out especially revolving around ai i I think it's incredible i mean right now we're building out uh our model to help students provide that one-on-one interaction and and it the you know, Khan Academy is the, the largest nonprofit organization in the space that's already tackling this, which is fantastic. You can see that this is going to benefit students, teachers, and parents monumentally. I mean, this is a game changer. This is this is incredible. But does that mean that we have to now start inputting this into our dating response? I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Again, but like every this is this is where we need the human intelligence. Um, Right. This is this my, is why video integration point, is a key. I think so too, because the video video is like for the same reason people don't like video. Some people are like I don't want to go on video. I'm like I get it. This isn't for you then, hmm. because on video you are in the moment connecting. You're no longer filtering through sort of like manufactured responses or like this is and this is what a relationship boils down to is like ideally the ability to be one to one. Um, but you know, mm. the point of AI is like the thing that concerns me is that AI is going to build and develop off the level of intelligence that it's given the data from. And I'm right. not convinced that the, I'm not convinced that the people it's learning from are the best people to learn from. I think that there are, mm. there's a big gap in terms of the emotional and psychological development of a lot of people and they might have intellectual brilliance but without those pieces we're going to end up with systems that are intellectually brilliant that but that miss huge parts of the human puzzle and dating is going to i think you'll see that gap happen in dating because even if you have like brilliantly intellectual models it's not going to work because when they come face to face Mm. that human reality is gonna it's gonna be so Mm. stark the comparison like oh mia this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time with us today. Uh, for 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 our viewers listening, uh, d- uh, can you please let us know where is the best website or social handle yeah, to absolutely. follow you and for all the single people out there as well, <laughs> uh, where they can find your app? I'm assuming, of course, it's both on iOS and Android devices. So please do come find us. The best way to go is to our website, which is where you can start the onboarding process, which is www love it which is l-a-v-e-t-t-e dot love love dot love and you can read more about us there and start going through the onboarding process it's the easiest way if you want to follow awesome. us on social if you want to do a little snooping you can go on instagram it's love it social club awesome i love that and i'm going to go definitely and there's no age restriction with the app i mean 18 plus 18. or whatever, whatever. <laughs> Okay, great. I'm going yes. to pass this. Uh, I'm going to definitely go ahead and let my friends know about this app. Actually, yes, right now, maybe like maybe I'll actually great. gift it to my friend because he's struggling. He's 40 years old and still he's single. Yeah, yeah. It, listen, and for now it's free. So like for the next few months, like it's it's a wonderful. Like if you jump in now, it's free for life. So get in, help us change the future of dating by you know becoming a founding member and adopting a system mm-hmm. which I think will give us the chance to build healthier human connections, which leads to a healthy human society. Mia, yeah, thank you for tackling this issue. I, uh, seriously, because when I do think, when I, when I really think about it, I, during this whole conversation, you are tackling a 
problems that are serious in this space and industry. Uh, so thank you for doing what you do. It's, uh, it's certainly not easy building out, build, building out, so especially something of this nature. Trust me, we, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, right? We don't, we don't talk enough about the, the, the hard part, right? We can only talk, we, Absolutely. A, a lot of us talk about the successes, but, uh, we we love this. Uh, we love what you're doing, and I can't wait to see what uh, what's to come. Well, thank thank you both thank so much you for so your much. time. Thank you. Of course, thank you.